Welcome back, everybody. You're listening to Cut the Shit, a podcast series that, through conversations and interviews with industry leaders, aims to take a closer look at the impact of the IT industry, both the good and the bad, and hopefully help all of us get better at making the business of technology work for our companies, our customers, and our economies. Cut the Shit is brought to you by Plow Networks, a managed IT services company based just outside Nashville, Tennessee. My name is Brian Link, and I'm the EVP of Products and Services here at Plow, and I'll be your host for this series. I'll ask questions, and with the help of our guests, try to dig deep on some of the key challenges we all face dealing with IT. So with that, let's cut the shit and get started. On today's episode, we're going to take a look at an industry we've never even touched on Cut the Shit, the music business. Since Plow is based right outside of Nashville, also known as Music City USA, we figured it was high time to dig in a little on the tech side of the industry. To help us do that, I'm really pleased to be talking with longtime Nashville music business executive, Mark Brown. Mark is an industry vet who's been up close and personal with the technology changes that have rocked the music business for the last 30 years. No pun intended. He also happens to be my brother-in-law, which made me even more excited to get him on the podcast. Some quick background on Mark. He recently stepped down after eight years as Senior Vice President and General Manager of Round Hill Music, a music publishing company started in 2010. Prior to that, Mark had spent over 25 years working as an A&R man for the likes of Sony and Capitol Records, as well as a publishing executive for Universal, Warner Chapel, and Lorimar. It would be an understatement to call Mark a Music Row survivor. Considering the turmoil the industry has experienced since the late 1990s, you might call him a unicorn. Many, if not most of the jobs that existed when he started in the 1980s, no longer exist. And he had a number of those jobs along the way. We'll spend some time talking about how he got into the business, his early days as an A&R man, and then how the internet had a bigger impact on the music business than you probably can even imagine. We'll then turn to the current status of the business, how COVID and remote working have come to songwriting, and wrap up by getting his take on where he thinks the music business is heading. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Mark Brown. Mark Brown, welcome to Cut the Shit. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. It's good to see you again, too. Um, I would ask you where you are, but I'm pretty sure I know where you are because I think I've slept in that room right next door to your office, if I recognize it correctly. You would be correct. I'm in my home office where I've been for almost two years now. Got it. So remote work has been uh, is is a real thing for you, just like it is for uh, for me. It is. And uh, I would have to say that I was reluctant at first and resistant at first and unhappy at first but uh as time has passed it's gotten easier and better and frankly i sort of prefer it now if i had to go to my office it would be more difficult all of my stuff is here gotcha gotcha we'll we'll get to put a pin in that we're going to get to that um as we go along glad to see you've got a cold uh cold beverage here's to a friday afternoon uh, to you glad to have you um, as I mentioned in the intro, um, Mark is not only a, a seasoned music uh, industry executive, he's also my brother-in-law. So I promise I won't take it easy on him just because of that. In fact, it may be the opposite. I probably give him a harder time um, because of it. And the conversation we're going to have today will be fun. Um, the interesting thing about it is that we've had some of these conversations previously, and they have been uh, spirited, to say the least, in terms of our discussion about uh, the impact on uh, of technology on the music business. Um, but before we kind of get to all that, Mark, to f- help 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 me um, fill in some gaps on your on your career and and help the audience. Give us a quick kind of thumbnail sketch. Tell us, walk us through your career, kind of in the music industry. Well, uh, I I guess it started in 1981 when I graduated from Vanderbilt University, and I took my degree in engineering science and a double major in economics, and I decided I wanted to be a guitar player. So I did what all Vandy graduates do. I started bussing tables at a local restaurant and playing in some bands. And I did that for about four years. The restaurant happened to be a place where everybody in the music business came every day. And I met every person that I know in the music business working in that restaurant. That was purely happenstance. Um, I spent my career working in music publishing and and doing A&R gigs at record labels. I've done each job several times, probably about 75 percent in publishing and 25 percent and record labels. Okay, hang on, hang on real quick. A&R, what does that mean? I've always wondered what that meant, so now is a perfect time for you to teach me what that is and probably some other people too. Uh, alcohol and restaurants. <laughs> okay, that's that's what I thought uh, based on our previous conversations, but I wasn't sure. Artist and repertoire. So the A&R man is the guy that signs the artist and puts the records together creatively. You match songs with artists, you match producers with artists, 
Um, you pick which songs get recorded, or at least in the old days you did. You decide what's going to be the next single. You decide uh, when you drop an artist, and, and you decide when you sign an artist. So you're sort of halfway between the business and the music side? Is that kind of a way to think about it? Uh, yes, you're the creative person. And so uh, it, in my career, in the publishing world, frequently I've been the guy that sells the songs. And in the A&R world, you're the guy that buys the songs. Okay. Okay. Good. That's that's what I was trying to get at. I wasn't real because I know, you, again, trying to suss out the various pieces and parts: publishing, recording. You know, you you don't have to write the song to play the song and sing the song. Where does all the pieces fit? So that that helps. Thank you. And then for the last eight years, I worked for a hedge fund, a uh, Round Hill Royalty Fund, and our commodities are copyright assets, uh, intellectual property, master recording. Uh, recorded masters, and we acquire and exploit those those assets. And we we are involved in raising funds, and thus far we've raised slightly over a billion dollars in three funds. And in the last uh, 15 months, there's been a public offering on the London Stock Exchange. So now part of Roundhill is a publicly traded company, and the rest of Roundhill is a is a hedge fund, investment fund management company. So those assets, those are copyrights of songs. Are they, is it old catalogs plus buying new stuff? Is it some combination of both? Yes. And in Nashville, we do all kinds of deals. Some of it's just, we might just buy a catalog of songs. We sometimes we might just buy the writer's share of a song. Sometimes we buy a producer's revenue stream or some sound exchange. Those are called neighboring rights. Uh, But the deal that I've done in Nashville most frequently is I find a high quality songwriter who has a a basket of assets, a song catalog that's full of hit songs with revenue streams flowing off of it. I acquire the asset and then I attach the creator, the songwriter, in a go forward deal, usually three or four years. So I'm buying various pieces of whatever he's got available for sale, and then I'm attaching him into a go forward deal creative arrangement so he keeps writing new songs for the got it so with the hope he'll make he'll write new songs and those will be you'll have you'll have a a, a pre-arranged uh percentage or take off those off those future revenues from those songs correct right and almost in every almost every situation we've been able to get songs that had not yet been recorded that came in the the asset package to get them recorded and have hits and then if the writer's on a roll and in his run He's a good, high quality songwriter. So in the three or four years moving forward, there's dozens of new songs and new hits, lots of new hits. Got it. Okay. We're going to talk about the publishing piece because to me, that area, you and I had a conversation recently about it being impacted by technology and the, and the pandemic. And so I want to talk some about that, but we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. Let's, so, so you basically wanted to be a rock star. Am I, am I fair? Is that, is that a fair characterization of where you were when you graduated in 1981? That's right. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, but I did know that music was something I'd always loved. So I thought I'll just pursue that. Got it. And I missed it by a, a country mile. So. <laughs> so, well, maybe not. I don't know. You, you're, you, you know, you're, you're, you seem to me to be pretty close to it, even if you're not on stage. So uh, I, I'm not thinking you missed it as far as maybe you think, but it, it made me think, you know, having grown up in Nashville, um, and the Nashville music scene, for the most part, has always been associated with country music. That's not really fair. There's lots of other kinds of music that, is, that has been recorded in Nashville forever, um, and that has continued to diversify. But when you broke into the business in 1985, was it on the countryside or was it rock and roll? What was, it, what was, the, mix, what was the kind of music you were dealing with? Well, uh, it, my specialty is in country music, but that's a broad... That's a broad... Sure. sector these days. So in 1985, for example, I went to work for a little company owned by the Oak Ridge Boys. It was called Silverline Goldline Music. And one of the writers there was a guy named Steve Earle, who I'm still dear friends with. And I arrived about six months before Steve made his Guitar Town record, which is a very important record in the Nashville music business. And everyone struggled to what to call that music back then, and they still do. Right. Is it Americana? Is it old school? What, what is it? Yeah, no one knows. That's, it sort of defies characterization, correct? It doesn't fit in a box? That's right. And I think nowadays it's called Americana. Back then, I don't think there was Americana. It wasn't quite roots rock. It wasn't rock, but it wasn't really country music either. So um, 
But anyway, for the most part, yes. My so, so did you like country music growing up? Yes, I did. I was a bluegrasser. I owned a banjo before I owned a guitar, for example. And, uh, and I did like country music. And I still like old country music better than I like new country music. Got it. So, so bro country hasn't necessarily been your favorite. Is that, is that a fair characterization? That would be a fair characterization. Got it. Got it. So it's the department of redundancy department. I mean, how many times can we take the girl out in the woods and in a truck? You got to be in a truck. You got to be in a truck and you got to have some beer. You got to have some beer near a river. And you're going to make love to her all night long on the hood of your truck, I guess. I don't know. It's, I mean, it's, it's it's a, it's a good, it's a good idea. It, it works. I mean, it, there's a lot of those songs that seem to have, have sold a lot of records and, and gotten a lot of airplay. So there is that. I thought it would end 10 years ago and it hasn't ended yet. And my company makes a lot of money on those songs. So not my company, my former company. I have. Correct. Uh, yeah. 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 You're going to have to, you're going to have to get used to that. Right. It's past tense. Right. I know that's, that's always tough. So, so Mark, you've been in the, the national music scene for a long time. Um, when was the first time you remember something technologically happening that kind of shook up the industry? I think it's happened many times, but uh, I guess, well, technologically speaking, it would have to be the advent of the, of the CD, I guess is what really changed things a lot. I mean, we went from eight track, we went from LPs on vinyl to eight tracks to cassettes to CDs. And so while I was actively in the music business, even when I worked at Capitol Records in the early 90s, that the sales were broken down in all three categories. It was mainly vinyl and cassette. And then right. later, then later CD came along and all of a sudden CD sales started taking off, cassette sales started going down, vinyl sales started going away, and pretty soon it was all CD. And that went on for I guess about 10 years. Until the next big one was Napster, the advent right. of the file sharing and digital sharing. And that was the sort of like the beginning of the end of the music business as we had known it up until that time, because people didn't have to pay for music and they didn't for right. a long time. And then finally, uh, also about the same time was the advent of iTunes, a major, major shift. So people could buy just one song at a time and and that really took off and dominated the marketplace for a long time. And uh, I'm not sure you can still really do that anymore. Um, later came streaming, and that's changed everything. Yeah, so I'm there's wondering. Been, there's been some significant, significant uh, technological changes. And back to the, the advent of the CD. What that did, it sounded better to most people. And so a lot of people went out and rebought all those records that they'd already bought. I went out and bought all the Beatles records on CD, for example, and a lot of other people did the same kind of thing. So that was a big change, a big shift. And we were just selling tons and tons and tons of records uh, between 1989 and about 1996 or 97. That was a salad. That was, I mean, that was the high water mark, wasn't it? Yes. And the the thing that made that happen was something called sound scan. I guess this is another technological advancement. They started actually counting the number of records they sold. When you bought a record, it scanned and it went in as one sale. Before that, some people manipulated the charts and by various means, they could put their artist wherever they wanted it on that chart. And I remember the first week that sound scan came out and the charts changed in the Billboard Top 200 about 60 or 70 percent of the artists on that chart were country artists. There were no country artists on that chart before that. And the biggest benefactor was Garth Brooks. He was number one of everybody in the world. And so they, everybody started paying attention to what was going on in Nashville because it's like, hey, these guys are actually selling more records than Stone Temple Pilots. And uh, who are who is Alan Jackson? Who are these people? And so Garth Brooks appeared on the cover of Forbes magazine, Time, Newsweek, the New York Times Sunday edition, and Nashville started getting a lot, a lot of attention. And that really boosted our sales dramatically. Let me ask you a question about recording technology. Um, I know there's been a ton of changes there as well in terms of really reducing the cost of what it would take to record something that was quality enough for uh, reproduction. 
When when did that start to change? I, I know it's not it, it's not. I'm I'm using GarageBand on my Mac right now to record this, and there are people who have recorded albums using GarageBand. That's fairly new. Were there other trends prior to that that were starting to happen that was that was beginning to make it easier to to record music that was of high quality? Yes. Uh, again, digital technology is what really changed it. Um, it was all on analog, magnetic analog tape before that. And one of the big barriers to entry was the cost of making the music. You generally had to do it in an expensive recording studio that had been built with expensive acoustical design techniques. You generally had to use expensive equipment, tape machines and microphones, and expensive session players to play the music. So to make a record in the early 90s might have cost $300,000. Uh, that was beyond most people's capability at the time and probably still is. So with the advent of smaller studios, better technology, digital technology, uh, sometimes starting in about 1990 or 1995, people were able to start recording things at home. Many people installed a home recording studio. It wasn't quite as expensive as the big studio. The gear wasn't quite as good, but it was far more affordable. And my joke used to be, uh, the good news is everybody can make a record for $25,000 now. The bad news is everybody can make a record for $25,000. And a lot of those people don't need to be making records. And the A&R guy was the right. gatekeeper that kept yeah. those people from making records. Yeah. Back this then. is this is the argument that we had, if you remember correctly. Um, <laughs> yes. That that evening way back when that my sister cringed while we <laughs> while we argued. So. And so uh, but that nowadays it is very um very commonplace. I have several writers, one very successful writer. Um, They do all of their demos and all of their recordings at home in the moment in the day. I used to get a completed song every day from Jimmy Robbins with it sounded like a professional recording. It had background vocals, it was mixed, it had overdubs, and he did it all for zero dollars. So Jimmy's been our writer for seven years now. I probably have 3,000 Jimmy Robbins songs and I have zero dollars in demo bills. So, wow. So that's a huge, yeah, step change. Like that's, that's as, maybe not as impactful as the, or, or as sexy as the story of the internet killed the music business, but certainly part of the story, right? Because part of the reason that the, the label system and the studio system was in place was because of the high fixed cost associated with actually producing the music itself, correct? That's right. That's right. And it's still expensive to market the music. Very expensive. Sure. That, I mean, yeah, to, to get people to know about something is, is not cheap. There's different ways to do it now, but it's usually it, the way I look at it is it's, it hasn't been digital advertising and SEO and SEM hasn't replaced traditional marketing. It's just added a layer to it. I mean, it seems to me. That's right. And so back to Jimmy Robbins, my writer that I was, my former writer that I was just talking about frequently or not not uncommonly those demos that he makes he writes with a lot of artists like kelsey ballerini Marin morris and and a lot of others frequently his demos become the master recording he either sells them to the label or licenses them to the label he may take them and do some sweetening like maybe put real drums on there or or a different guitar solo but the demo that he did in the moment that sounds really good it actually becomes the record without any major changes so it does take, I mean, production costs, it really becomes reproduction costs, not production costs at that point. Stamping that out into a, into a digital file, which isn't hard to do, as, as any of us who've copied a, a Word document can tell you. That's right. Well, I want to take one step back. Um, just one of the things that's interesting to me about the, about the impact of technology on businesses is, is how some businesses are quick to adapt technology, others are not, and some summer in between. And so what was the mindset in kind of the late nineties, sort of, sort of pre Napster digital, you know, the internet was, was, was for real. It was obvious. It was for real. People were starting to do stuff online. Um, music hadn't necessarily migrated online, but there was this thing called the internet. How was the industry thinking about it at that point? How did you guys look at the internet? What did you see when you saw it? I think that we, this is a broad generalization, but I think we, didn't embrace it correctly at all for a long time. We spent a lot of time and effort and money fighting against it. 
we tried to keep people from being able to record our music or re-record our music. We, we, there was a man named uh, Andy Lack, and Mr. Lack ran uh, Sony Records for a while, merged Sony with BMG. He came from the television world, from NBC. He wasn't a record man, and he spent a lot of money, maybe $100 million, a lot of money, developing a CD that could not be copied. And this was a major initiative of his. And the day they released the very first one, some kid in the mailroom figured out how to scratch something off over here and poke a hole over there and you could copy it. <laughs> and <laughs> needless to say, it didn't work. And Mr. Lack didn't stay at the company for a whole lot longer than that. He moved to some other division of the company. I'm sure he's a very powerful man somewhere and he will probably have me squished <laughs> somehow. But, but my, my point is, instead of embracing the technology and understanding that the distribution system is now worldwide and inexpensive. We fought against it and tried to keep people from sharing files and copying music and spent a lot of time going the wrong way. I always said when I sort of got my head around Napster, it took a minute just to, I mean, but literally just a minute. Uh, if you'd make it cheap enough and easy enough, people won't steal it. And it took us a long time to get there. And, and, and honestly, that's what iTunes did, right? I mean, if you think about the, you know, the unbundling of an, of an album and allowing people to buy a single meant they could buy their favorite one or two or three songs for three bucks instead of 18 for the full deal. Right now, the economics of that are not as good, um, perhaps, right? I mean, one, correct. What you just said is from the, you know, the late 80s to the late 90s, I mean... There's a there's a lot of hookers and blow that got paid for with 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 uh, profits from the music business, right? I mean, it was a good it was a good time to be in the music business. That's right, and and a frontline album, uh, you know, in two thousand and three, still cost eighteen ninety nine. And so, if you wanted the one song that you liked, you had to buy the other eleven that were no good, maybe, and you just couldn't. It wasn't a singles business anymore. You had to pay the eighteen ninety nine. Once again, if we had gone the other way and cut the price in half, that would have helped. We would still have been making a lot of profit. Uh, uh, but it was, yes, it, yeah. that's, we, it didn't go, classic, we didn't go the right way. Classic incumbent, classic incumbent story, right? Where you've got, you, you've got margins, you've got a system built, and you become a defender of that system as opposed to uh, how do I make it better? Or perhaps do I need to potentially reinvent, right? That's always a challenge. I, I'm not going to throw the music industry under the bus. That's, that's a classic story in business has been played out over and over and over again for, for a lot of obvious reasons, right? Incentive comp, right? Uh, shareholder interests, fixed cost, you know, sunk cost bias. We've made all these investments in X and Y, all, all of that sort of stuff, right? That That's there. Um, yeah. And, and instead of, realizing that the dissemination of the information was limitless, we tried to, like I said, control it. Yeah. Well, and, and then, you know, there was a whole effort to, to demonize people who were illegally downloading music and, and all, you know, there was, it became a, it was, it was ugly. Uh, no, no question about it. We took the wrong stance there. We, we were, we were going and arresting kids in their bedroom who were stealing 50 songs and trying to make an example out of them by taking them to court and prosecuting them. Yeah. And that's not a really popular. It's not a great way to win customers. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, looking back on it, it just seems so obvious, but it just was not obvious at the time. Right, by the right. way, the sales and distribution uh, teams in these record labels were big, powerful. They were very fat cats. They were the pride themselves on spending five thousand dollars at a dinner and showing off and those jobs don't exist anymore none of them they're, they're gone. gone all of them right right alcohol alcohol, alcohol, alcohol in restaurants, restaurants is not necessarily as much of a thing anymore is what you're saying well that's not not in the distribution world in the sales <laughs> world gotcha gotcha all right well let's um let, let's let's transition a little bit we've talked about the past let's talk some about sort of the present um, obviously streaming is where we are today. Um, how has that been, I, you know, the business side of it, I mean, I'm interested in it, but I don't necessarily want to get into it on the podcast. Just in terms of the business itself, 
How do you see the impact of streaming? What's it doing to the business as a whole? Is it a good thing, a bad thing, sort of a, it just is what it is. It really, people are going to make music and, and we're going to figure out a way to, to get it to people. What What's sort of your perspective on that? No, it's definitely a good thing. It has been a huge turnaround for the uh, music business. For the years between, let's say, 1999, the advent of Napster, I might be off by a year. No, you're right. It's 99. And through 2000 and, I don't know, uh, 10, um, sales were in decline. Revenues were in decline. The business was taking a beating. Uh, it was just more bad news after bad news. And with the advent of streaming now and the streaming services, even though they're not paying fairly, even though they're stealing the music too, to some extent, uh, it's been a, a boom in and revenues and record labels coffers are full and overflowing and they're doing fantastic and the songwriters and the publishers are lagging way behind but we are catching up slowly the d disparity used to be about 12 to 1 for the master owner as opposed to the creator and now it's about 4 to 1 or 5 to 1 which is better and the music modernization act which passed about five years ago had some additional improvements in there for the mechanical royalties uh, for the writers and publishers. Um, all of the DSPs have not not paid. Uh, they all have filed lawsuits and appealed the rulings, and they're not paying. They're crooks. Uh, as, DSPs. What now? Is that the streaming platform? Well, for specifically Napster. I okay. Mean, I'm sorry. Specifically Spotify. It's Spotify. the biggest okay. villain, but it's also Google, YouTube. It's all of them. They're not paying. They're not paying fairly, and they're still using our music without paying us fairly for it. And there's plenty of that. There's plenty of pie to go around there. They could, they could. They say that there's not enough money in there for it, but there's got to be enough money <laughs> in there for it. It's hundreds of millions of dollars a quarter, and you know, um, a, a little more detail to this. Um, part of the reason that the labels and the master owners got paid so much more is they were investors in Spotify. They own significant pieces of Spotify. And I remember having a dinner with the guys from Spotify and I said, uh, something to the effect of, um, would it be possible? Would it be possible that the reason that this, the disparity is like it is because those guys are owners uh, in your company? And they said, I don't know. And I said, do any of the major record labels own part of your part of Spotify? And the guy said, I don't know. I said, well, I do. Warner's owns 9% and <laughs> Universal owns 12%. And it's in the it's in the 10K, right? You can find if you own more than 5%, it's public record. It's not hard to find. That's right. And the guy said, well, all I know is we do what we're supposed to do. And I said... Okay, fair enough. I said, um, he had said it would be un unfair to think that we would have to identify the writers and the publishers of each song. There's millions of songs. And I said, wait a second, that's ridiculous. We solved that problem a long time ago. They're just files. Yeah, they're just computer files. Yeah, that's easy, actually. Every phone call you've ever made your whole life, there's a copy of who you called and how long you talked to them for. And it's for worldwide. It's billions of transactions. We track them all the time. And if, and if you <coughs> did something wrong, they can probably tell you what you said somehow. And, you know, we can keep track of who wrote the songs and who publishes the songs. That's not hard. And I said, oh, by the way, it's in the metadata that I said, where do you get your music from? He said, we get our music from the labels. I said, well, that information is in the metadata because they license each song from us. Right. And he said, it's not in the metadata we get. That's when I said, well, maybe someone is, is short circuiting the, maybe there's the, a reason for that. Right. The information yeah. flows somewhere. Yeah. So as you guys can probably tell, Mark has some strong opinions about the music business, which I'm really happy to be able to provide a platform for him to share those with you. Um, if you want to know more, he's available if you like to buy him beer at a variety of places around Nashville, and he can tell you more. I have no doubt about it. So anyway, <laughs> I, that's all true. Anyway, I, I, anyway, overall, it's been a good thing for the business, and it's getting better. And the publishers and the writers are... Uh, are are slowly catching up. And by the way, so back to what I said, the dissemination of the information is 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 growing exponentially, 
And as these, you know, I, I didn't get my head around how are companies like Spotify who are losing $500 million a quarter operating and going to make it? Well, it's all about scaling. And if they get to uh, 500 million subscribers, a lot better than 30 million. If they get to 5 billion subscribers, okay, it works. Right, right. right. So well, let's, let's, let's come kind of, we've, we've kind of been at 30,000 feet talking about the industry and some historical trends. Let's, let's kind of come back. Uh, a little closer to home um, and talk specifically about your part of the part of the world. And that's publishing. When did you get into the publishing side of the business? Was that that when you went to round Hill or was it prior to that? No, that was in 1985. It was my first. Oh, okay. You, so you started in publishing. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. So, and uh, to be honest with you, I didn't know what music publishing was. I, I had, I didn't know. I sound- well, as you can tell, I don't either. So, <laughs> well, it's, it's, it kind of sounds ridiculous, but I didn't know what the company, I just knew I got a job. And I remember telling my mom that I had gotten hired in the music business. And I think her response was, oh, no. And uh, <laughs> they were kind of hoping that maybe I would go get a real job. And right, right. she said, uh, what are you doing? I told them the same story. I was working for the Oak Ridge Boys and their publishing company. She said, what do they do? I said, I don't know. And she said, are they going to pay you? I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, how much? I said, $300 a week. And she said, every week? I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, oh, no. Okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> the first day I showed up at work, I was in an office filled with some bookcases, and there were reels of tape on the bookcases with writers' names on them. So being smart like I am, I said, oh, I guess they do something with songwriters. And I pulled out the tape boxes and there were song titles on there. And I said, so I guess these writers work here. And uh, OK, so I'm looking around the room and back to Steve Earl again. Steve used to come see my band and Steve would sometimes kind of talk your leg off. And I thought, boy, I hope that guy doesn't work here. And about that time, hey, man, he came into my <laughs> office and we became great friends and have remained great friends uh, ever since. But uh, it took, you know, it took me a minute to realize, okay, these guys are writing songs and I'm going to go take the songs and try to pitch them and get them recorded by someone and try to exploit the copyright. And we're going to make money by selling records or by getting radio airplay. Got it. Basically okay. Two ways you made money back then. Got it. Okay. So you've been doing this a long time then. So <clears throat> how, I, I'm my assumption and, and it's not my assumption. I know the, sto- I know some stories. So, Songwriters are an interesting group of people, um, based on the stories that you have told me. Um, they they're they're varied um, and colorful in in many cases. Um, how would you describe songwriters and kind of their use of technology tools outside of their instruments? I mean, how, what what's that been like in terms of in terms of their adoption of technology? Well, th- there are still sort of two camps. There's the older guys who still write a song maybe have a work tape that they <clears throat> make on their cell phone or, or something. And they stockpile 10 or 20 songs. And then they go to the studio and they book a session and they hire session players. And they go in there and they make recordings, demonstration recordings of those songs. And they are fairly expensive. I would say a thousand to $1,200 per song. And then there are the Jimmy Robbins who have figured out how to do it themselves on their own, on their computer in the box. And the product is at least as good. It's certainly more uh, easily attainable, quicker. And uh, that's been the, the basic change there. So has that split changed during COVID? Did you see some of the old, did, was, did the studio recording opportunity continue or were they, were they forced to do something different? They were forced to not record in the studio. Some did, but I mean, early on, it was kind of figured out that probably the most dangerous thing you could do would get in a be getting a room together and sing at each other. Right. Uh, right. As you were writing a song or as you were recording a song, have the musicians all sitting in the same room together just didn't happen for a while. And then it did start coming back online and a lot of people got sick and some of them died. But uh, the, the, the advent of the zoom, right. Has been the most important thing that came out of this. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about that. So yeah. Tell me about that. Well, a, a lot of people, figured out, well, I can't go and sit in the room with them. So I'm going to have to figure out how to do this another way. And that's not a new technology. The Zoom technology is not new. We had we had Skype for 10 years before that. We had uh, other things. Web meetings are not new, right? We've been doing those for a while. 
Yeah, yeah. But for some reason, it clicked this time, and everyone adopted the technology, and everybody got good at it pretty quickly. No one liked it at first, but pretty soon, everybody got behind it, and it started working really well. So I remember calling one of my writers. I was driving to my farm, and I was listening to a couple of dozen new songs that had come in that week, and uh, I was thinking, God, this is these songs are really good. And I called one of them and I said, man, I know you said you hated this Zoom right, but I think these songs are good. In fact, I think they're better. He said, no, you're right. They are better because we can't hide behind a track, a cute little sound or a hook. We're having to write the songs on a guitar or a piano and a vocal. And he said, when we get to the part where the tricky part where something's just not good enough, we have to look at each other and just say, that's not good enough. And we're working on the lyric a lot more. And he said, when we get done with it, I usually have a tempo and I have a, an acoustic guitar with a vocal guide track. Then I build a track around it, send it back to the, the artist or the singer, let them sing it. And they pass it around. And then, you know, we have a finished track. He said, but it, they are, they're better because we have to slow down and make it better. And so I think that's a big improvement. So, so another that... big improvement, another big improvement is I don't have to fly to Los Angeles to write with the guy. Or that's, to London or to New York. That's what I was going to say. I mean, the, the geographic limitations are removed with this model, correct? I mean, and so what's that been like in Nashville? I mean, obviously Nashville in many ways is no different than than Silicon Valley or Washington, D.C. or New York in the sense of part of the reason that there are a lot of people there who are good at doing certain things is because you needed to be there to be around other people who were doing certain things. But the music business is it certainly... I mean, I guess it's worldwide. There are people all over the place. Has have you seen a broad have has have you seen more talent come in from other places that didn't actually come into Nashville, or is it just people in Nashville now don't have to be there, and so they're able to leverage connections wherever? I think it's a little bit of both, and I think there's no substitute for being in person with someone. That's always going to be there, but I do think it has opened people's eyes to the fact. Oh. I don't have to fly to London to write with that guy who's the guy. And especially if it's someone you already had a relationship with right. personally before, it makes it a little easier. It'd be hard to meet and write a song over Zoom with someone you'd never met before. Um, but I think as soon as they can, they're going to get on the airplane and go again because, because there's no substitute for the real thing. But, what it has also allowed people to do is let's say we wrote a song together and I'm getting, I'm running it down and I just decide, man, that bridge just isn't working. It's just not right. And I can call you up and say, Hey man, tomorrow morning before you're right, can we get on the zoom for 30 minutes and fix this bridge or something broken about this? And I can't figure it out. You can go, yeah, I can do that. I've got an hour before my right. I mean, everybody, most of these guys write a song every day, just like a regular job. And they usually start about, 10, 30, or 11 o'clock. So it's easy to grab somebody for just a minute. Or can you fix this vocal? You you sang the wrong word, or you're, you're off pitch, or I need you to fix this for me. Okay, I've got an hour. I can do that tomorrow morning. And that's really, uh, that sometimes used to take weeks or months to get somebody back in the studio to fix something that they messed up. Now they got can it. be fixed the next day. It's more, it's more durable. It's plastic because of, because of the technology. Right. A big, a big improvement in productivity as far as I care. So, you know, one of the things that I think about when I think about you in Nashville and I think about having lived there in the business, you mentioned it, it you know, it's, it's, it's a relationship driven industry. Most are, um, but this one in particular, I think is, is maybe even more so than most. Um, and with, with what's happened with remote, remote work, there, there's some advantages and disadvantages. And you mentioned one in particular, which is it's a whole lot easier. I mean, you and I can get together and talk because we know each other really well. So to do something remote doesn't feel awkward. But so how's that been for someone who's new to the business and trying to break in? What's that been like for the last couple of years uh, in particular? I think it would make it really, really hard because, I mean, the way you do it is you network your way around. And when you get here, you have to go to the writer's nights and you have to walk up and say, hey, my name's Brian Link. And, you know, that's my big pickup line. <laughs> not, not Brian <laughs> Link. My name's Mark Brown. And they almost have to tell you their name. And then you've got a conversation going. And right. it's, it's worked for years. And, you know, if you can't get out there and meet people and and connect with people, 
it really would make it hard, I would think, to to make it work. You know, the young guys come, they, you know, they're getting off the bus every day, as I joke. And they go to the bar and they see some guy playing the guitar and they walk over and say, hey, that's really cool. I'm a writer. You want to write a song? And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It's kind of like blind dating. But if you do it a few times, you find somebody, oh, that girl was really good. I want to do that again. And that's how you that's how the system works here. It really is a lot of of its personal connections. I mean, my joke is it's high school with money. Everybody knows everybody right. very well. Right. Okay. Well, I, I I thought that, and I think that's you know just that's if I were to you know to back out from the music industry and think about the folks that we work with because we don't we don't do any business right now with anybody in the music industry, but we work in a lot of other industries, healthcare and financial services, and you know trucking and other you know other areas. I think they'd all say the same thing in general, right? That the idea, you know, if you're a new employee at a, a large company and you can't go into the office every day, it's hard to sort of accidentally on purpose run into people, right? I mean, it, it, it makes that part difficult. And so I think that's a limitation for remote work that we're going to, we're going to wrestle with for younger employees um, as that, you know, as it, assuming that, assuming the trends that we're seeing continue and, and it looks like they will maybe not pure remote, but at least hybrid you know, hybrid work experiences are probably going to be with us for a good long time. I, I don't think there's any any doubt about that. So, um, I think that'll be something for us to watch. So, a couple a couple other things I wanted to close out with before we um, before I let you go. Um, two big things that that we're seeing across all kinds of industries, um, you know, is the impact really of cybersecurity issues and then data analytics. So, around cybersecurity what, what, how's the industry, is that something you guys even think about much or is it the same sort of vanilla concerns that everybody else has? You know, you live in a digital asset world. So I was just curious about how's the industry thought about that and and what's been going on there? Well, it, it, my personal experience is that we thought about it a lot. We have, uh, we used to have regular, I say regular, at least once a year, some kind of cybersecurity training. And we would have uh, a company and an expert come do a, I guess, do a Zoom chat with the whole company and teach us things about just commonsensical things that aren't necessarily common sense. Don't don't click on an attachment from an, an e- on an email from someone you don't know. Don't do that. Right. And look, here's things you look for to, to let you know this might be a suspicious email. The the address doesn't look right, or it doesn't. You don't know the the people on the cc or it doesn't make any sense and and things like that and report this to us because we're going to uh you know we'll look into it we spend a lot of money on firewalls and all kinds of uh cyber security protections of course we're a, we're a financial company we're a we handle hundreds of millions of dollars and so there's probably a lot of sensitive data that that they don't want people to have access to Sure. Uh, for me, I, if Kim Jong Un steals the lyrics to a song, I'm not really that concerned about it. But, <laughs> but there are a lot of delicate uh, uh, deals and and uh, and monetary factors uh, sure. that we would have to protect. Yeah, it's not you know it's not the you know it's not like a financial industry you know it's not a financial services company or healthcare where there are regulatory implications. I mean, if you if you if someone steals your your IP. The government's not going to be upset about it, but your shareholders and and your ability to make money that that could be a real problem. So it's certainly a business risk, correct? Well, for Roundhill, there are regulatory concerns. We are uh, overseen by the Securities and Exchange. Ah, uh, that's true because it's a hedge fund. That's right. We have to do mm-hmm. a lot of reporting, and we have to have all kinds of uh, compliance concerns addressed, and we have to keep all kinds of records. And right, uh, right. Yes. So, so how about data analytics? I mean, it seems to me. I mean, we you know you. you not very many people will use an expression like metadata and know what it means and use it correctly. And you did both. So, you know, this, this points to me that this is actually an industry that understands data in a way that maybe not, not others did um, or have known about it and understood it for longer than a lot of, than a lot of industries have. So what's going on from a data analytics perspective, what are you seeing there, particularly in the publishing side and, and how are, how are you guys leveraging that kind of capability? I'm not positive. I know what that what that is exactly, data analytics. But I do know we hired we've hired two two guys that have that job title in our okay. company in the last year, and I know they're really smart guys and they're highly valued at whatever it is that they're analyzing. It's important shit. 
<laughs> All right. Yeah. I tend to, I tend to think of it as, have they done anything for you that was predictive in a way that gave you information or some sort of insight that you didn't have before in your job? Well, I guess, I guess not directly, but I'm not, you know, I, I, I guess not directly for me, no, because some of my job is still creative. A lot of it's uh, finance work and business affairs work. And, but I, they haven't brought me the TikTok star that I've signed and made a million dollars on yet. And they haven't said, look, this guy has blown up and he has a billion views in one week and you really ought to go sign this guy. Which- or, or even better, this TikTok person doesn't have a billion views yet, but they're going to. So you should talk to them now. Right. To me, that is where, in terms of a predictive capability, would really be pretty interesting from the publishing side, from, from sort of your side. Not, I mean, they may be doing lots in the marketing side and other things. I was thinking more around sort of the artist selection, artist identification um, p- process. That is going on very actively. Record labels are definitely paying attention to those, those metrics and those analytics and signing artists based on them. And some of those artists work. And some don't. artists don't work. Yeah, yeah, sure. And sure. so it's not there. You know, we've always looked for a way to make this a science. And, and it's, it's a an little bit more of an art than it yeah. is a science. That's true. Yes, That's you true. can support. You can least see trends and you can look for things. And this means this is going to happen. But what you can't do is reproduce it the next time and turn the crank and out comes sure. another star. Yeah. I mean, if you knew what a hit, if you, if you knew what made a hit, then you'd only have hits, right? I mean, it would, it would, or you actually wouldn't have the word hit. There would only be songs because they would all be hits. Um, that's right. And you know, uh, like the weatherman, I'm wrong about 80% of the time, but you know, it's the ones that you find. It's not the ones you miss. That count. Gotcha. All right. A couple last questions. Um, when you look at the industry, uh, and you've been doing this a long time and you think about what, you know, what do you see in terms of the future? Is it, Brighter days ahead, dark clouds on the horizon, or same shit, different decade. I mean, how how would you characterize it as you look forward? No, I think it's brighter days ahead. I think there's so much talent out there. There's so many more talented people who are so much better equipped to deal with what they're doing. They're smarter. They're better educated. I sort of thought that these songwriting degrees and some of these music programs were bullshit, uh, 20 years ago and 30 years ago, I, I don't think so anymore. They're cranking out. I meet a lot of talented young people who've been to college to learn about the music business, and they're really good at what, they, what they've what they learned. So, and I think artist-wise, we're seeing, gosh, there's there's so much more opportunity and so, mu- so many more avenues and so much more talent that's being exposed. There's also a lot of, a lot of crap. There's a lot more crap and a lot of clutter. But the ones that are good, there's more of them and more opportunity for them. It doesn't have to go through just one company and one radio station and one TV network. And, you right. know, it's it's not just the Ed Sullivan show anymore. We got more. Right, right. So last industry question before we kind of switch to other stuff. You know, when, what's something that's really that's happening right now in the business that, that, you know, a trend or a development that's really that really excites you? Just kind of one thing. Well, uh, just overall, everything we've talked about, I just think there's an unlimited opportunity to exploit these, the content. There's more and more avenues for the content. Content's always going to be valuable, more valuable than ever, I guess. And so uh, I, I, just think that's, I just think that's a big plus. And it's just going only one way, more and more and more opportunity. Excellent. All right. Well, wrap, well, I'll wrap it up just with a couple of things personal. Um, so I always like to do this with guests just to sort of finish things up. So since you're in the business, you're, you're, you're both a, a business person in the music industry, but you're also a fan. I know that and a player, uh, still, still, uh, still hitting the guitar regularly. I know that who is your favorite guitarist? Well, that's, that's a, not an answerable question. I mean, <laughs> I, I can... You're already dodging. Come on. I could narrow it down to a couple of dozen, but, uh, you know, all right, I'll let, I'll let you, who's your favorite band? Well, uh, this is a, an old, an, a, a, some old friends. This week's my favorite record is a new record by a group called the Delavantes. Mike and Bob Delavante and I have known each other and been in business since the early nineties. I signed them to Warner Chapel when I was there to a, a songwriting and publishing deal. I signed them to Capitol Records and made a record on them when I was at Capitol. 
and uh, they've just put out a new record, and I got it this week, and I've listened to it a couple of times, and I think it's fantastic. The Delavantes. All right, well, everybody go check that out. I'm going to do the same. So, all right, so. Uh, they got a comment back on a Twitter feed. They're getting all these, you know, talking about, wow, what happened to these guys? It's my favorite band from 1990s that I listened to this record. And it's like one of the comments I really like that said the, the Delavantes, uh, did a Rip Van Winkle. They disappeared for 20 years and they're back and it's just as good as ever. <laughs> so last question, since we're recording this on the Friday before the NFL championships, the conference championships, uh, give us your prediction. Who are going to be the two teams in the Super Bowl, and then who's going to win? Well, gosh, uh, I guess it's going to be the Rams and the Chiefs. Uh, I just uh, obviously I'm a Titans fan. I'm a Nashvilleian, and I I was just heartbroken the other day. I thought we outplayed those guys, and if you're going to sack the quarterback eleven times, we only got credit for nine because they cheated twice. They the <laughs> clock expired on one, and they call a timeout on one. But if you're going to let's just say. If you're going to sack their quarterback, who's supposed to be the best quarterback, they were comparing him to all kinds of legendary quarterbacks. And I think he is a really good quarterback, by the way. He's good. He's good. If you're going to sack that guy nine times and lose the game, man, that's that's hard. That's Three turnovers. Really hard to take. That's, that's what that's it is. That's hard to take. For sure. And uh, uh, But having said that, after I watched the rest of the games and saw that each of them ended on the last play with some kind of heroic turn of events – I didn't feel so bad because all right. of those teams were pretty good. Yeah. And Tom Brady came all the way back and lost. I mean, you know, uh, but Patrick Mahomes, okay, you can give, you couldn't give, Joe Montana couldn't have done it. He's the greatest. And he had, he had 13 seconds and he, and they couldn't stop him for 13 seconds. It was so unbelievable. Bad ass. I guess he's going to win the whole thing. I told, I told, I was watching the game um, the, the, the week before. And I told, I can't remember who I was sitting with, but I said, this is like watching backyard football at the highest level it's ever been played. Because he is making stuff up and doing things that I've never seen anybody do that it's just unbelievable. Like, as a defensive coordinator, you must be thinking, I don't, I, I just would prefer to call in sick today because what do you, I mean, you, can, you, you can't scheme for that. There's nothing you can do, right? And, and at the end, that last game, they really just, they just dismantled Kyler Murray, but Earlier in the year, when the Titans played him, it was just like that. We we did we just looked like we were didn't know what to do. He yeah. was just literally running circles around us and made us look stupid. Yeah, for and, sure. And that's the same thing that Mahomes can do, and a lot of others. I think we have more talented quarterbacks in the NFL than I can ever remember. Well, it's a similar story, I think, to what you just said for the music business. Not for the same reasons, but it feels like that the talent level is even better and that there are better players kind of at every position. Um, and I mean, don't get me wrong. There's been some rules changes that have really helped uh, offense. I mean, it's an offensive, it's an offensive game. I don't know about you, but you, you know, I guess I shouldn't say you couldn't pay me enough, but getting, being paid to be a defensive back in the NFL has got to be one of the most, most ludicrous, ludicrously difficult jobs given uh, what you're trying to deal with. But regardless, it's, it's made it a lot of fun to watch. That's for sure. Well, those defensive backs, once again, they're so good. They are so good. They can. They are so good. They're so fast and they're so good. The, the, I've seen more. I mean, I, I don't even think they taught this when I was a kid playing football. But you know, the art of getting your hand in between the two hands and pulling the ball away. Yep. The no, art man, of knocking the pass down without interfering with the guy. These guys are doing amazing things. It's and true. And it's it's, true. it's it's just it's it's amazing to me how good they are. Yeah, it's fun to watch. It's fun to watch. Well, Mark, uh, we'll wrap there. I'll let you get back to uh, enjoying your uh, temporary retirement. I think gardening duty, I believe, is what you called it. Um, I expect we'll be seeing you back in action at some point, uh, maybe later this year. I know the industry will be looking forward to having you back. So um, I I can't thank you enough. I, you know, I, 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 le- I played the, bro- the brother-in-law card to, to get you to do it, so I, I, but I, I appreciate you doing it. I really do. Thanks for having me. It's been fun. Good to see you. All right, man. Take care. So long. Cut the Shit is brought to you by Plow Networks and is produced by Talia D. Domenico and Emily Starnes. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, we'd be most grateful if you would share it with others who you think might be interested in hearing a somewhat irreverent take on the arcane world of IT. If you aren't enjoying it, well, why are you listening? You can find links to this podcast on our website at plow.net, on our YouTube and Instagram feeds, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, LinkedIn, and probably a bunch of other places too. Or as my kids like to say, just Google that shit. You'll find it for sure. 
Take care and have a great day.